so i as a child i used to be living in a place which was uh, very close to a forest basically so i have a forest uh, very close to my house if i just walk for 5 minutes we have a small forest which is uh, belonging to uh, nmpt that is new mangalore port trust which is a railway forest so as a kid only i used to explore the forest all alone i used to be in my vacations i used to spend my most of my time visiting the forest and uh, just just observing doing nothing so basically just looking at maybe butterflies or trees or water maybe uh, even before that as a kid uh, i used to be engaged in activities like uh, catching fishes for example with my friends so uh, and maybe from the very beginning itself i am in touch with nature so then as a you know student uh, i took my bachelor's in uh, zoology uh, botany zoology and uh, biochemistry at that time i had uh, some of my friends who really instilled uh, interest which which is very uh, deep okay and uh, they were bird watchers one of my friend uh, by name uh, ashrita she is currently working at nature conservation foundation so she was into bird watching basically and uh, through her and one of my one more friend uh, who is in sri lanka so we formed a club called wildlife club in our college then that was the, you know maybe the beginning point like where it was very serious sort of then i met some of uh, wildlife biologist and uh, conservationist like uh, dr kv guru raja who who's well known across the country <clears throat> for his work like the kumbara night frog the potter frog okay and uh, i was attending one of his conferences and then i asked like uh, can i discover a new species then he said why not <laughs> it's very easy okay that made me really think like there is a lack of uh, you know participants or uh, or i can say researchers in the field of uh, taxonomy i thought like why why can't i do some research on frogs here yeah see uh, most of the people like to be inside a closed room and do their research because it's maybe they find more comfort so for me comfort is being in, in the nature in the midst of uh, wild so it uh, it's an individual perspective i believe so somebody want maybe want to do research inside the lab but somebody would like to do it outside the lab so i am a category which belongs to the second okay so i would always like to be in nature so according to my perspective i thought if if i'm going to do research that will be based on behavior and outdoor and you can't exclude the part of being in the lab in any type of research so a part of it happens to be in the lab so which was unavoidable so that's what and also majority of uh, people are concentrating on uh, larger charismatic uh, flora and uh, fauna not flora fauna so like uh, tigers or maybe leopards or uh, whales so uh, birds and mammals are uh, more of uh, thrust of the area of research in biology because of uh, maybe they are large they are charismatic and a lot of funding uh, is available but uh, when you think of a frog nobody knows about a frog like uh, they say oh mendak or what is the use of uh, this uh, particular species but we should understand that every single creature has its own uh, potential role being uh, maybe the part of the food chain or uh, producing some sort of chemicals which may be beneficial to humans or overall maintenance of ecological balance so i feel that every single taxa has its own significance and its own flavor so when you dwell deeper into that uh, each uh, field or each taxon only you understand how unique each uh, group is it's not only mammals every single group it let it be an insect or maybe a spider or uh, maybe some snakes for that matter everything has its own essence so i found my essence in herpetology so it may be for someone else it may be snakes or <laughs> yeah it differs right yeah as i told you people see big things like you know much more than the tiny ones or the critters so that's what we we need to create awareness because people do not know so the thing is people still do not know when i go and talk to people they they really admiring Oh, this is so beautiful this is uh, their behavior is so unique we didn't know about it so maybe 
we also need to contribute so i feel that our contribution is uh, very important and uh, crucial maybe a game changer in the coming days to create more love towards uh, maybe the smaller creatures than uh, just uh, thinking about bigger charismatic uh, creatures like lions or tigers or leopards maybe okay so maybe it's our own perspective has to change it's each one of us and the more you create awareness it's going to change definitely yeah exactly see uh, the thing is what we are taught from the very young age that is going to influence our uh, later days right so even if you see textual information it may be maybe a crow is there maybe a tiger is stories are based on that right so it's not on a frog or there may be a you know a queen and kissing of <laughs> maybe that except that i have not heard anything of maybe frogs or maybe an insect for that matter so we have lot of things which is a sort of which is called macro world okay which is very very small we need to see uh, with an eye for observation so that comes with the experience and once you start it it's going to have a kick start right you know that so you're going to observe them more and uh, you're going to understand the seriousness of uh, the business what they have in the whole ecosystem right so that has to happen only if you observe so because of lack of observation and lack of data people are not aware of the you know sort of uh, amazing world what it is so i think it's all because of the perspective with which we are looking and uh, we are lacking the data in our whole system as you said maybe schools and colleges also don't have much of them in their curriculum right and people also don't know unless you show them oh there is a spider they don't know that the spider is simply sitting there and hunting right so you don't know yeah see the status of uh, these iucn status has their own criteria it may not be just uh, extinction of the habitats or uh, you know number of it may be just that the population itself is restricted to a very small range so if you consider iucn criteria there may be it is not a single criteria there has been multiple set of criterions taken to assess any species so it depends on individualistic uh, approach how they have assessed a particular species but overall if you have a generic view a generalistic view we feel that overall there is a degradation of uh, habitats which is taking place because you know that frogs specifically have a very uh, minimum range you say as a you uh, know area of crunch or territory right in other species so even these have some sort of that territory but it is very restricted you know that a frog may not Uh, travel more than few kilometers in its own lifetime so you can think a tiger may require thousands of square kilometers so where is the frog just requires that 1 kilometer or 2 kilometer range imagine the whole patch of forest is being wiped out tomorrow for some reason maybe you want to build a plantation and a plant like a thermal power plant gone right boom it's wiped out so it's not like any other species so the threat on this uh, minimal uh, dispersal species is very very high okay so that's i feel that's a major threat because these are not able to move whereas birds maybe if tomorrow there is some problem in uh, your place maybe they'll come to our place right <laughs> because they're able to fly but these are not like that if that place is gone they're gone forever because there are some species if you see if i have to name few there are some species like uh, uh you might have heard resplendent bush frog which is found only in, in that peak of uh, the anamudi or uh, the you know other other parts misa pulimala and all that in uh, parts of the southern western ghats so if you find like uh, indigo bush frog which is uh, from the kudremuk peak only from a particular part of the western nowhere else so you understand right if that part is gone it's gone so that's the major threat for these organisms which are very very endemic means locally endemic okay that's that's a major threat i will because of which maybe they have been placed in critically endangered and also endangered group but we still do not know because the frog what i discovered i can call it as a critically endangered species looking at the area because it's found in a very small area we, we have not got it anywhere else but i did not intentionally put it in critically endangered because tomorrow somebody else may 
find it from some other place of uh, India, right? Parts of it, and it becomes uh, completely a uh, wrong information. So it is better to uh, put it under data deficient. So data deficient species are also there because of uh, a lacking research. Okay. See, climate change is a phenomenon which has to be looked at a long term, I believe. So what we see in our entire lifetime may not be very evidential to state that climate change has uh, changed the physiology of uh, an organism. So I am at, I am right, right now at not a position to say that, okay, I have seen a physiological change. No, because my course of lifetime has been very, very short to state that. If I state that, that would be wrong, right? Exactly. That's a very interesting uh, idea and question because the trend has been uh, changing. That means more, more people are getting into research uh, on amphibians. I see many of my friends only are interested to do research because if you see maybe down the line, uh, 10 years back or 15 years back, hardly you could count people like maybe one or two, you could say, these are the frog researchers in the entire of India. But now you can definitely say there are more than 30 or 40 or 50 people at least okay and not huge like other fields so the thing is number of researchers have increased that's to be taken into account other than that the techniques what we use have changed before morphology based the taxonomy used to happen where people used to go for identification of oh this is a green frog this is the bullfrog this is a red frog this is a it's not going to be happening like that now because the thing called molecular phylogeny has come into play. So after systematics lab in Delhi started working on uh, frogs, Dr. S. T. B. Ju's name is quite uh, phenomenal to be mentioned here because uh, he has done an amazing work of discovering over 100 species. So I think with his uh, kickstart in the field of uh, batterycology, uh, there has been a lot of change, mainly because of uh, bringing the molecular tools, we are able to differentiate very closely uh, looking species. Two frogs may look very alike by morphology, but they're different species. Because we have the tool now, we are able to you know, delineate into these uh, species, not simply based on morphology, but based on uh, multiple tools like uh, molecular tools and also acoustic uh, tools, because you know that frogs communicate by sound. So sound is another character by which you can differentiate every single species based on their frequencies and maybe their pulses or number of calls per minute or different criteria we have because I also work on the sounds of uh, these frogs. So now I can pinpoint and say, oh, this is the frequency. This is the number of calls per minute. This is the number of pulses. Or this is the frog it is going to be. So how accurate, or how specific it is, right? Like every sim single species you can delineate or differentiate by using uh, the data from the calls, also data from the molecular uh, phylogeny. So we are able to differentiate very closely related species morphologically. And that's how we are able to arrive at a status where we have more numbers than what we had uh, prior to 2000. So if you see numbers have increasing, doesn't mean that uh, the threat is a decrease. It is not like, you know, equally going on there. But the thing is the techniques have improved, but we still do not know at the same pace there may be destruction happening and species might have been lost even be before we have discovered here. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, this uh, Kodial is my own work, but uh, really we are a part of the team. Uh, mainly credit goes to Dr. S. T. B. which I want to clarify this moment. So, uh, Kodial, when I was working for my uh, thesis, for my PhD work, so I was just exploring the places around my place, which is coastal Karnataka, okay? So at that time, I was just, just on my visit to different parts of uh, field. So I was on my motorbike and with my uh, friend, fellow friend and researcher, Dr. Going to be Radha Krishna. So we heard a very unique call okay like uh, a sound which would just make me think it's an insect so but uh, somewhere my instincts told me that it's not going to be a, an insect let me just have a look 
so we just came back after our field work and we just attended that place and uh, quite fascinatingly we found uh, a frog which i had never seen earlier in my encounters in the ghats or any other places which i had visited and also this call was quite unique which i had never heard it just sounds like uh, very 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 dull and very feeble and uh, the frog also is very tiny and i thought why can't it be a new species because we have never seen it let us just explore the you know molecular biology and the uh, acoustics of that so it turned out to be a new species challenges would be that you know that it's a city and uh, uh, working in the city is quite challenging people would sometimes come uh, and want to smash us because we, they think we are terrorists with all the bags and you know gumboots <laughs> so all such things have happened so but working in the city is quite challenging because my work was dealing with uh, the city frogs so night uh, permissions and uh, going out in the night and uh, working overnight people and cops all that problems are there but overall it was i like i enjoy working with uh, amphibians so it was a very uh, memorable and cherishable experience so bird watching as i mentioned uh, i got into serious bird watching only when i met uh, one of my friend in my college days so who who was a uh, avid bird watcher but uh, uh the thing is uh, it changed my perspective towards birds after that because uh, their behavior maybe their uh, way how they like you know gather food or their dedication so all that uh, matters a lot right so and also their beauty sheer beauty of uh, birds you know that 1300 plus species are there so i am also a photographer basically so in the perspective of that photography i prefer birds because they are more abundant and uh, you know that birds are many types if you if it is a tiger people go to shoot tigers so only one species right panthera tigris tigris but 1300 species so every day we get to see new species we need to make, we get uh, we, we get to make a lot of new photographs and new behaviors all that so overall maybe i am more driven towards their beauty uh, and photography sense uh that made me a bird watcher and yeah that driven to writing a book which is in collaboration with dr smita from nitte uh, yeah okay so this see there can be multiple reasons so uh one thing is quality of water so if you see sometimes the bird visits or bird numbers may increase due to more uh, organic matter in the water right because that will lead to algal bloom and these basically feed on uh, <clears throat> zooplanktons so i feel that maybe the water quality has increased probably right so i don't know what exactly the studies are saying so we need to look into the more research what's going to be happening but if you see in mumbai the case has been quite uh, reversal the number of uh, flamingos have increased and they have received this year 150000 uh, close to yeah 150000 flamingos in, in parts of which are very close to the city so you can see overall <clears throat> maybe that the organic matter content has increased in mumbai because they may be leaving lot of uh, like you know uh, flush into these uh, water bodies which has increased overall uh, algal blooms and uh, zooplankton uh, density might have increased so we we don't know the exact answers unless we uh, check what is the quality of water what is the plankton uh, you know density all that so maybe i can just tell very uh, broadly that this could be the reasons but we need more research uh, down the line you know, to check but i think overall the numbers uh, are still not that bad to say that chilka lake is not attracting birds definitely birds if they don't come to chilka this year they may come next year also because it is quite plastic the visit of birds is not very like you know fixed so you need to think about it because birds are very smart if if they find that this place is not good they want to visit a different place and if they are going to find that okay in the next coming years the place is restored they want to visit definitely because birds are winged and they can uh, move to any other part which is better than this right so we do not know in the coming years what's going to happen
see this is quite controversial okay the 5g thing so so far people have been saying that uh, uh, these mobile towers are causing death of uh, birds so but as a bird watcher if you go around and see there are birds nesting on the mobile towers okay so i really don't know it's a very uh, mixed uh, situation sort of mixed sort of uh, responses what we get so i think 5g still is not out but we need more research to say that this is uh, causing death of bird because there has been a lot of controversy i also read that the california institute of technology uh, professors also already have done work and they're stating that these uh, frequency that is 10 megahertz right so that has no harm on birds so when there is already research stating that there is no harm i don't know how people are already predicting that uh, without 5g being uh, implemented we can't uh, have any you know very strong uh, opinions about it i feel because uh, we need more you know research and more people involved in research to say that yes it is causing harm but as far as we know i don't think there is going to be but yeah again speculations okay so as a part of a nature watch uh, documenting the nature and phenomenon happening in the nature is also very important right as a naturalist so i started uh, with my own uh, small camera as a, a student i always had a urge to buy own my uh, my own camera so i could uh, gather some money i could work and make some money and bought my first camera which was a panasonic lumix fc35 so from that since then i didn't stop actually <laughs> so this i have my sixth or seventh camera now so i have been upgrading so it's it's a passion so if you are really having a passion which is very intense and uh, which is true then i think uh, it's going to work out in your way but if it is not true then you're going to see that subsequently you're going to drop that right so it's a, it's just like any other hobby what uh, other people have because it gives us uh, you know a lot of time to explore uh, the nature around us and to to try out new perspective of uh, landscape maybe or birds so overall it's it's a learning right so by the end of the day so it's a learning for me see since i travel places uh, i find the basic uh, rule here is uh, the construction okay the earlier days you used to see that we had had something called a tiled roof if you have seen right so where they used to use the tiles and uh, where there used to be space and construction was in such a way that they could build nest but if you see such type of tiled roofed houses where do you see now like so very rare so i basically find that the construction architecture itself is changing which has been facilitating birds like uh, maybe your kites and uh, as you pointed pigeons which require just a small edge to keep their uh, nest right and also some sort of a but these need a special sort of uh, arrangement to build their nest which they don't find it appropriately in the urban dwellings now though so that may be one of the reasons why they have slightly been pushed out from the cities but they are still there if you go towards any village i definitely find them in good numbers because they find good amount of food source because agriculture is still practiced in outskirts of the cities but agriculture is gone food is gone their house is gone because tiled roof houses are gone all rcc so i probably find that this could be more justifying than just saying uh, uh, you know waves are causing some sort of a change because possibly yes i'm not denying that fact but there has been you know very evidential uh, and uh, direct evidences that things have been changing in terms of our architecture exactly see people's emotions are tied up with uh, these actors and uh, movies and it has to because indian bollywood is uh, influence and this is from i think tamil right the movie uh, 2.0 so even i have watched that movie so part of it may be true but uh, not completely because you, if it was happening then every day you would have seen a bird dead in your uh, front yard i believe right so it's not happening so uh, truth is in front of us right so we have more bigger problem to address like uh, deforestation and uh, you know habitat fragmentation or you know encroachment all that 
so let us discuss that you no know, instead of this and wasting our time on the because research already is showing that there's not much of harm so i really don't know why we are uh, uh, pointing much on these minor issues than the major issues where we are losing hectares of forest right for some of the developmental project which has to be stopped first i believe Yeah. Uh, firstly, you need to look at areas which uh, needs attention. Okay. Uh, please do some your, some of your homework to see where there's a lack of uh, data, lack of information, where there's a lacuna, right? Then perceive your like you know goal. Like you try to perceive and also get some fellowships. Like because research in India requires at least some amount of money to do research. You can't simply spend your father's money. So you need to have some fellowship. So clear some exams. uh students uh, for them i'm just requesting that clear net or any other competitive exams where you can get some fellowship then be perceiving and be uh, like you know be dedicated to your work and it's your work which is going to speak rather than uh, your words i believe at the end of the day so if people recognize your work then uh, you will end up in a better place right so it's all about our dedication to the field and uh, yeah think of conservation also because finally this is the only earth uh, which we have right so overall be the best and give your 100% in whatever you do then i think there is nothing called scope so i i don't believe in the word scope so scope is you so if you are having the scope then definitely the scope is always there okay